Welcome back to Turpentine VC, the podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. Today, we're joined by Chris Zioli, partner at Wing Capital, who shares Wing's data-centric investment approach as early backers of companies like Snowflake and Pinecone. We discuss Wing's enterprise-focused AI thesis and break down the competitive dynamics between OpenAI, Meta, and Anthropic. Chris also offers insights into the massive infrastructure build-out reshaping data centers and semiconductors. Let's dive in. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining. Great to see you, Eric. Long friend. Yeah, likewise. So Chris, let's start with a brief introduction in terms of what is the scope of things that you invest in over the last few months, last year? How have you narrowed down the, the categories that you're particularly interested in investing at the moment? Yeah, totally. So I have been at Wang for a little over two years. We're an enterprise-focused investing firm, so we don't do any consumer, don't do any international or fintech. We're very focused on kind of how data is being put to use in, in the modern enterprise. So that, that leverages a few different key components. We were early backers of Snowflake, uh, Cohesity. So kind of building off of that foundation of, of data infrastructure within the, within the enterprise. And now kind of the last focus of the last two years, after about 10 years of focusing on, on structured data is, is taking on all these unstructured data challenges. And that's kind of where AI comes into play. So that's all these new data sources that have really not been tapped. So that's that's the macro theme. The micro theme within the macro theme is a lot of different infrastructure vendors. So happy to dive into that too. Yeah, but first let's even start more high level, which is just AI investing. How do you identify the the different areas that one can invest in and how, how does how do you and your firm think about okay these are areas we want to play in these are areas we don't want to play in and 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 why is that yeah so we we borrow a lot of thinking from the prepared mind framework that that Peter learned at Excel so we're we're spending time within a few core focus areas that that we're really highly interested in we kind of have an outstanding belief that that data is, and have felt this for a long time, is that data is kind of the foundation of AI. So within that, we kind of map the flow of data from all these different sources and like how you can actually put them to use. So we're spending time talking to buyers of these data systems, thinking about like what are the most strategic sources of data for those enterprises. And then so you, know, you kind of identified the data. Now it's kind of actually putting that into production and, and building the system that flows all the way from the source, whether that's emails or documents or, or all types of stuff like that, to the processing of that data, whether that's the embeddings model, where we have some investments that are actually Voyage AI, which is actually focused on training better embeddings models. So some of those are done. Some people use OpenAI's model. Some people kind of have turned to Voyage, which is higher performance for certain chunking of information. We're looking at RAG pipelines as well. So RAG has kind of become the dominant architecture that people incorporate their private enterprise knowledge into AI applications. Uh, that's all stored in a vector database where we're backers of Pinecone, the leading company behind the vector database architecture, as well as how does that get put into production into an application, whether that's an internal application or an external application. Most of the early usage of AI was Internal applications, much easier when you don't have to worry too much about the data and security governance issues. But when you want to expose, you know, a customer support bot or an insurance claims bot or, or something to the end customers, then a lot more risk comes into play. And that's kind of what creates a lot of the, the security opportunities within AI. But that's kind of the general flow. There's a lot of other parts to getting to a better model, whether it's like what used to be called fine tuning now is kind of more morphed into RLHF and, and kind of the small model thesis, whether latency or domain expertise are kind of the two things that people are, are heavily focused on. So we're investors in Gradient AI and I'm on the board there. That's kind of one of the leading companies putting small models into production at financial services firms, tech companies, healthcare, et cetera. Uh, I want to zoom out even even, even further. You, you wrote a, a blog post called the, the talking about the major computing cycles. What what did you find there? Or how did you think about why was it helpful to situate AI within these different re re revolutions? And and what does that tell us? Yeah, so I I, I learned about this. This actually Jensen's framework for 
for kind of the ma major data and computing cycles and how we got, got to here. So the whole internet is based off of this retrieval technology, which is basically you, you kind of make a query, something comes back on the other end. It's very structured. There's kind of not really much room for error. And it's, it's all kind of one-to-one -one mapping. I, the kind of IP addresses are kind of a good, good, a good way to illustrate kind of how retrieval architectures work is like you have, you have something directly to map something to. Jensen talked about, we're kind of moving into this new era of computing, which is retrieval pr plus generation. And that's where the retrieval augmented generation comes. Generation really augments that, that retrieval process, which is the core of how everything from like Google to file systems to, to websites work is like they're performing a retrieval oriented task. So he kind of paints this picture of, you know, generation is kind of the future of, of all computing, whether it's internet based or, or knowledge oriented. That kind of is a completely different architecture to actually run that generation process. You need totally different hardware. It's super demanding. You can do multiple levels of generation. I mean, there's, there's kind of more simple oriented generation. Like you ask a chat GPT, a pretty simple task and it, it, it spits it back, like let's say asking it about who the first president of the U.S. is. There's not really that much generation that needs to go behind that. But if you ask it something much more complex where it needs needs thinking and reasoning, that's where generation really comes into play. And that's kind of how he describes the next architecture cycle that we're moving into. That's got it. That, that's helpful. So if 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 you break out the AI investing world into the the models on, on on one side, you guys don't don't haven't made any bets there. You think it's kind of too late there. Well, it's a it's an interesting one. I mean, we have looked at a lot of vertical specific models, and I, we have a bunch of companies, particularly in the drug discovery space, that are doing that are are training their own models. So we 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 do believe there are opportunities for models in specific data realms or specific verticals that have some unique aspect to it. I'm not an expert on the drug discovery side of things. My partner, Sarah, Ansu and Gaurav are, but they're basically trying to predict how proteins will react to different molecules. And that's kind of the foundation of how they're, they're thinking about their models there. I mean, in the, in the large language model universe, and then multi I'll, I'll gonna kind of get into multimodal too, in the large language model universe, we do think it's it's super capital intensive. So there's kind of an ongoing battle between the closed source players, OpenAI, Anthropic, et cetera, and then the open source players, some of which are open, but are kind of backed by massive entities like Meta <laughs> that are pu pumping in $20 billion just this year into the chips to actually train them. Mistral is kind of the next closest open vendor, although they've kind of pulled back some of their open models and are quite, so you, you kind of have to be, you kind of have to raise at least a billion dollars to, to play in that, that world. It's interesting. We kind of see we're getting to a point of diminishing marginal return in models, which like everything is kind of getting to this roughly 90% accuracy uh, benchmark and kind of each subsequent uh, round of training, you're getting less and less incremental performance. So we, we, we have a very active discussion of, you know, are we moving towards a world of model commoditization or are we moving towards a world where kind of the leading model providers that are accumulating more and more data from network effects and people typing in prompts, getting answers, people rating answers. It's a, it's an open ended discussion. I tend to believe we are moving towards model commoditization though. And distribution is going to become more and more important. So that's how, how we're thinking about the, the broader landscape. What do you think Meta's most recent move means for OpenAI? Well, it means they have a competitor who is as well-funded as them. So they're going to invest the same amount per year. I, I think the information just put out today that, that OpenAI spent, will spend $7 billion this year on inference and training. Their total staff costs are one and a half billion. So it's, it's pretty insane. They're spending five times more on, on computing than they are on, on actual people. Meta, I mean, they're, they're 20, we're going to invest 20 billion this year. So they are inc incredibly well funded. They will probably be able to compete on 
multimodal stuff. I expect them to invest a lot there, just given the nature of the, the Facebook family of apps being image-based, being video-based, media-oriented. They're not going to want to lose that battle. So they're going to they're gonna invest on both of those fronts. I think OpenAI has an advantage with the, the, the user feedback, particularly, and like collecting all this massive amounts of user data. That was a huge a huge boon for Google as well. Obviously PageRank and the user behavioral data was really what put them over the top between Yahoo and, and others. It's kind of widely stated that in the early days of Google, the accuracy was not that much better. It was, it was pretty marginal versus other search engines. But that, that new technique of PageRank plus all the user behavioral data that they began to gather and incorporating that into the product was really kind of how they they improved the accuracy of the the retrieval process that they that they kind of built that we all know is now as search engines. I think that's going to come into play too with with OpenAI and like you'll get more and more of those thumbs up, thumbs down. Which of these answers do you like? Type prompting and 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 the outputs that, that the model gives you. So there's going to be a data network effects game over time and. Yeah, I, I, I use Meta's models sometimes, but I find myself going to them less just because of the, the way that they're productized. So I think that, that that will become increasingly important. So you're bullish on OpenAI long term? I am, yeah. I mean, my colleague Zach just put out a, a really good piece about the business model of OpenAI and them making 55% of their revenue from consumer subscriptions. I mean, they have about 8 million global consumer subscribers i don't see why like all of the all of the world's knowledge workers won't won't have at least one of these models and i think they're going to get better and better at understanding the users that they have like you can kind of really do deeper research on the type of queries that they're running let's say i'm asking a lot of queries about data infrastructure or cybersecurity those type of things like it kind of gives them more 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 kind of awareness of what type of data sets they need to be going after, how they need to be improving their their models for certain types of users. So I think they have a big, big advantage there. I mean, the API business that they have also, I think, is 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 very strong. Their, their developer interface is, is definitely the best. We've seen a few of our portfolio companies generate huge amounts of interest just from being in, in the docs of, of OpenAI. Uh, and that's kind of be, become a, a powerful place to, to be as a startup. Some of the most, the highest street cred that you, you can gain is is getting endorsed in their docs. So I, I do think that they have a, a really big lead. I think the, the consumer side and the enterprise side will be different. On the consumer side, it'll be Gemini who's probably going to become the closest challenger for a lot of the type of queries that, that get routed to to chat GPT and on the on the enterprise side, which is like 45% of their business, I think that's where that's where they'll see Anthropic more. But I mean they have such a big lead there, especially coupled with Microsoft and, and some of their cloud partnerships. That'll be hard, but there's kind of like a central versus access powers type dynamic forming with Microsoft and OpenAI and then Anthropic, Google and Amazon, who are both the two biggest investors in Anthropic. So I wouldn't underestimate the weight that Amazon particularly will have behind throwing itself behind Anthropic. I think Google's going to be really focused on the consumer side and kind of trying to compete with ChatGPT. And let's see if they can catch up. They obviously were stumbling earlier this year, but are looking more formidable now. So I kind of break it down into two, two sides, the consumer side and the enterprise side. Say more about Meta specifically. Do you think this is a mistake or like what, what is sort of the decision that they're or sort of the strategic thought process that they're having investing $20 billion a, a year into this? And are they prepared to just keep scaling it up or where does this play out for them? Yeah, I mean, Zuck certainly goes big. I mean, he he was quoted today saying, you know, I'd rather over invest than under invest, which I, I certainly respect. I mean, he's 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 behind the biggest platform and consumer over the last 20 years. So he's playing big. He's obviously made a big bet with Oculus investing 50, 15 billion a year there. So I think he he doesn't want to be beholden. He Facebook runs by far 
the most number of inference calls of any company globally. I believe they run a trillion inference workloads a day, which is over 10x the next closest. So they don't want to be beholden to anybody who's charging a variable cost on models. Makes sense. They are very much beholden to, to this chip providers, though, in, in training this for themselves. So, so about 14 billion of that 20 billion that they allocated this year is just going right to NVIDIA. Pretty massive, over 10% of NVIDIA's revenue. We'll see what the upgrade cycles of, of, of these data centers look like. I mean, that's, that's a huge topic of debate is, you know, will people need to be getting the latest chip every year or will these be like three to five year or 10 year up, upgrade cycles? People don't really know yet. A lot of debt financing is happening on the back of really long-term upgrade cycles for companies like CoreWeave and Lambda. So that's a really important variable is like how long how long will these actually last you know are you going to get a few good training runs are you going to get like the next two families of llama and then have to upgrade or is this going to be a really long-term investment that that doesn't depreciate super fast it is moving to one year upgrade cycles kind of like apple did in in, in iphone which will put pressure on competitors like amd who are you know, they, they, they release a new chip. It's slightly better than, than NVIDIA for a few months. And then and d particularly during the last kind of last three to six months of the prior gen. And then NVIDIA launches a new one. And NVIDIA is trying to close that gap basically by going to one year upgrade cycles. So I think it's, I think it's bold. I mean, it's economically irrational, at least to this point, like they're not charging for inference. They're not charging for consumer subscription. They're not charging for APIs for access to their models. It's more, we don't want to be relying on other people's infrastructure at all. And, and that's kind of a engineer's mentality in Silicon Valley. Sometimes you end up spending 20 billion on something that like you could have just bought from OpenAI for a billion. Other times, like it becomes super important and like you kind of end up building the next, like that's kind of how AWS got built is, is they didn't want to be beholden on other people's file infrastructure. So it can lead to huge innovations. It can also lead to big R&D efforts that don't work sometimes. Yeah, that's well articulated. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Feeling overwhelmed by a jungle of point solutions for your company's spending? Expense management here, corporate cards there, bill pay hiding somewhere else entirely? We've all been there. Introducing Rippling Spend, the game changer that brings everything together into one unified platform. Imagine this, total control over your company's spending in just minutes. Rippling Spend lets you manage expense reports, issue Rippling corporate cards, bill pay, and more. You can say goodbye to the days of juggling multiple logins and scrambling to reconcile accounts. Rippling Spend streamlines the entire process, saving you valuable time and resources. But it's not just about convenience. Rippling Spend also lets you proactively control company spend with highly customizable controls, like auto-approving DoorDash orders under $25 for managers and above, and block transactions that are out of policy at the point of transaction. You can also set custom expense approval chains, instantly issue and revoke corporate cards, eliminate manual transaction reconciliation, all so that you can close your books three times faster at the end of the month. Stop wasting time and money on old traditional credit cards and fragmented solutions. Take control and simplify your company's spending with Rippling Spend. Visit rippling.com slash spend today for a free demo and one month free. Rippling.com slash spend. Our sponsor for today's episode is Carta, the end-to-end -end accounting platform that's purpose-built to power the strategic impact of the fund CFO. For the first time ever, private fund operators can now leverage their very own bespoke software that's designed from the ground up to bring their whole portfolio together, enabling formations, transactions, and distributions to flow seamlessly and accurately. The end result? A remarkably fast and precise platform that empowers better strategic decision-making and delivers transformational insights on demand, timely K-1s, holistic fund performance data, and so much more. Come see the new standard in private fund management at carta.com slash investors. That's carta.com forward slash investors. So, okay, we talked about foundation model providers. We will get more into sort of the infrastructure stuff, which you're very active in. Are you, how about on the application side? How do you think about that? And are you doing a bunch there? 
Yeah. So I'm not as deep as my colleagues, Tanae and Zach there, but we have done a lot of investing there broadly. We're very intrigued with with a lot of these vertical vendors, particularly in markets that have lots of unstructured data. So, so companies like Harvey in the legal space, we look to with a lot of respect. We look at at Glean as a company that that is bringing kind of rag like approaches to to the application layer. We're looking for for other new verticals as well uh, acro- across a bunch of different applications. But I spend a little bit less of my time there. That makes sense. Okay, so let's let's focus on the the infrastructure side. You started to a little bit earlier, but maybe you can sort of map out even further the different kinds of of, of opportunities and where you think there are investable opportunities versus, versus where maybe they're, they've already been picked over or it's unlikely to be venture? Yeah, totally. It's it's a hard problem. I mean, they're, like OpenAI is, is trying to compete across different parts of the stack and get, get more into the data flow. The data side of things is really where we see the most opportunities. That can be Parts of parts on the ingestion side, helping you handle particularly these newer data sources that haven't historically lived in in warehouses or databases. That's where that's where the new data and the incremental performance is going to come from. So we we like we like all the tools to help you build rag pipelines. So that can be embeddings generation, which we've made a bet with Voyage AI. That could be extraction of information and entity mapping. So for example, in a, in a term sheet, the board is not like a wooden board that like an LLM would interpret it as. It has to be mapped to an entity. So there's a lot of that, his or hers in a, in a, in a text document. There's a lot of those really complex technical problems that kind of map to search in a lot of ways. Still a really unsolved problem that we think is going to be increasingly important for LLMs to get to that last kind of, we're kind of at this phase where we're getting that last 10%. How do we go from 90% to 100% accuracy? We'll probably never get to 100% accuracy, but how do we how do we get incremental performance from here? Those are a lot of the techniques that, that are coming into play, particularly on the data side. We're very interested in in, in all this kind of structuring of, inf- of both unstructured and then different modalities of information. So there's a lot going on on, on the images side of things. There's c- certain companies we're, we're very interested in that are using models themselves to label certain types of data sets. So kind of going after the human labeler and things like, like image labeling, audio labeling, where we're investors in DeepGram AI, which is kind of the largest text-to-speech infrastructure provider, we're seeing data become increasingly important for all of these infrastructure providers. And they're kind of thinking about how do we get the new sources of data in the, in the cleanest ways possible? And how do we get as much enrichment of that data as possible? So we're, we're really focused on tools that, that help drive that. Do you have a broader request for startups or things that don't exactly exist yet or that you haven't made bets on that you would really love to? Yeah, I'm very interested in this this extraction oriented product that can pull that can pull information out of different content types and structure it. There's kind of been some early ingestion tools, some of the legacy ETL vendors have kind of bolted on some support, but they're not doing extraction and transformation. So that's that's my my top request. I'm very interested in in the log, the logging and monitoring space as well. It's obviously a huge historical market, like with Datadog, Splunk, AppDynamics. There's there's actually like probably 10 more that are worth over 5 billion each. That was historically a space where there's kind of information overload. It's all structured information. And it's there's a really important decision from the end user of like which which incidents and which logs do I investigate? So I think models can incorporate a lot of unstructured behavioral data there. And that is a space that I'm pretty optimistic will get reshaped. I mean, Splunk just got acquired within Cisco. There's kind of a, a lot of, a lot of excitement about what models can do there. That, that's both like security oriented plus like application performance oriented. So very interested in 
all that's going on in log land as well. Yeah. The you've, we also, we touched briefly upon it on, on data center stuff. S say more about how you, how you think about either opportunities there, or how you approach that space. Yeah. I mean, it started from like the observation that, you know, an increasing percentage of companies are coming in asking for half of the round to go to, to go to GPUs. Thankfully, we've kind of moved past a lot of that, although we do see tons of companies spending multiple millions per year there. So started with, you know, what's going to happen with this, this computing need? Are we going to be in a world where, you know, gross margins actually go down and, and, and computing just becomes increasingly costly for, for all the companies we want to invest in that want to incorporate AI. And then it began to like trace into all these other challenges with this major data, data center upgrade cycle, whether that's networking and sharing data across huge GPU clusters. We're kind of in an unprecedented era where you have thousands of machines processing huge amounts of information together and they need to stream what they each have done to each other. So that's like a networking problem that is at a scale that is just not not precedented before. So so going into that, learning about kind of some of the the AI networking initiatives that are going on with with some of these companies like Arista Networks and, and Nvidia who acquired Mellanox, kind of having an opinion there. Then even tracing it down to like what's going on in memory, how does this data like actually get get transferred to the machines? Even even things as niche as like kind of components in, in the data centers so with companies like Astera going public. We've seen a couple of new companies emerge that are solving different parts there. Even have like looked at things like a, that are super niche, like cooling, where there's like both the industrial scale cooling of these massive data centers, like building like HVAC like systems to like how do you actually cool the chip and prevent the chip from overheating? So like we've heard from a lot of GPU clouds and, and big data center operators that as much as 30% of these chips are overheating every year and become unusable. So cooling is kind of like insurance on, on your, on your huge GPU investment. It can also mean if, if just a few parts of your, of your GPU cluster goes down, like the whole system can go down. So there's kind of some reliability issues there with with cooling that we've we've been interested in. There's so many things. I mean, a lot of talk from people like Sam Altman about things like power and, and building nuclear reactors and how we're going to run out of electricity. And I'm, I'm less of an expert on that, but it's it just shows the complexity of of building out these data centers. So have gone have tried to go deep on all those different subcomponents and think about which ones actually could be viable for a new company. Let's also get into cyber briefly, because that's also a space you got to do, but why don't you share your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, cyber, cyber's in a moment of change. I mean, we are, we are, we know we need to get better models. The way you get better models is more data. The way you expose all your data to, to a model system creates a ton of security risk. So model developers and data engineers they're kind of they're tasked with getting a building a better model, so they're exposing everything. The way you get the best model is literally not to hide anything. So it's kind of an unprecedented security risk. It's kind of like a ask for forgiveness type security strategy. So when 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 these models, this, particularly the ones trained like that are that incorporate private enterprise data, started to to come out. The governance challenges were, were like you were, people were aware of them right away. And, you know, there's some, there's some easy fixes, like don't reveal salaries and don't reveal personal information and stuff. But there's a whole bunch of much more complex ways that really sensitive information can get exposed. And actually understanding what's sensitive and what's, what's not is a huge problem as well. Security has been moving towards a world where it's not necessarily all top down driven from the CISO in the way that it used to be in the, in the era of kind of network and endpoint security. We kind of have saw companies like Sneak emerge and GitHub emerge where security became in the hands of, of engineers and, and it was kind of an everybody responsibility. I think 
what's going on in model land is, is an extension of that trend that's already been happening where everybody who, who works with data is going to be responsible for security in, in some aspects, in some ways like that can broaden the market for, for security a lot. So if, if you have a, a SaaS company that's scanning what goes into models and you have a huge team that's trying to incorporate all the different data that they're working with into the models, you can see how that, that'd be a much bigger business than a business that just sold to, to the CISO. So that's, that's what I'm excited about is like that it's becoming a more democratized use case where everybody kind of pitches in a little bit versus kind of one person sitting in a Fortune 2000 company and scanning down thousands of alerts and, and kind of thinking about what to focus on. I want to address some of your, your, po- you have this great blog that people should check out. You wrote this deep dive on the state of semiconductors at the end of last year. What do you think are, are some of the main things people should know about the overall semiconductor landscape and how to make sense of it? Yeah, yeah, it's a super good question. I think people should know about how these chips are designed and like the complexity that goes into the, the into the design process. So you know, there's even great software companies in 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 the semiconductor landscape like Synopsys and Cadence are some of the best software monopolies I think in the world and globally. I mean, they can cont- they grow 15% every year. They they actually have probably the, the highest per seat pricing of any software company I've ever come across at over 30K per seat. So, so people benchmark the spend on those tools, which are called EDA tools, to like the total R&D workforce of all the semiconductor design companies. And like that actually gives you a pretty good sense of, you know, how much how much they can capture and things like that. There's a whole bunch of other important vendors. I mean, some some parts of the semiconductor landscape are kind of tied to the traditional data center, while others are kind of tied to what's going on in the AI data center. So if you can kind of distinguish the two, I think that's a, a really important uh, distinction to, to make. You know, some have a legacy in both, but understanding that I think is is super important Certain, certain of these companies like we are unilaterally bottlenecked on like ASML where like literally nobody else can make those machines globally and they're $300 million machines. Gave me a ton of respect for the, for the complexity in building these businesses. Like ASML works with over 10,000 components just to make one machine. So it kind of gave me a ton of respect for the complexity of these, these global supply chains and like you know, all these, all these things we take for granted, they do get reinvented and historically have been some of the biggest outcomes in Silicon Valley. So I think a lot of people over the last kind of 15 years became obsessed with cloud and software and, and that, that stuff's all great. But, you know, the semiconductor, the total market cap of all the semiconductor companies is like almost 2x as big as all the software companies, including Microsoft. So... I am I'm open for pitches in semiconductor land. <laughs> and what would they need to contain? Like, you know, where, where, where's the opportunity today? Yeah, it's a hard one. I mean, there's certain business models that can be inventive in certain areas. I mean, ARM is a big one in, in this IP-based business model strategy. Synopsis and Cadence make about a third of their revenue from IP-oriented product lines. I think like, that there's a lot of interesting ways to distribute your product through Synopsys and Cadence. So th- those are some of the novel things that we've seen. I mean, you need to be a deep domain expert to be to be working in this field. It, it tends to not be a field where you see kind of 22 to 25 year old founders, and you see more like 50 to 60 year old founders or or 40. But I think a lot of there's been a lot of there's there's a lot of accumulated domain expertise from some of these folks, particularly who've led big product lines within broader orgs. So people like who've led the networking division within within Broadcom, people who led the networking team within NVIDIA, people who worked at Mellanox in in Israel before NVIDIA acquired them, 
I've seen a lot of people spinning out from those groups and that's a good, that's, that's a, a top profile to look for. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash turpentine. That's oracle.com slash turpentine. oracle.com slash turpentine. Hey everyone, Eric here. You know, at Turpentine, we're always looking for ways to streamline our work. That's why we use Notion for all our internal documents. It's been a game changer for us, and I want to tell you why. Notion is this amazing all-in-one workspace that combines your notes, docs, and projects. But what's really cool is their new Notion AI. It's like having multiple AI tools built right in. You can search, generate, analyze, and chat, all without leaving Notion. What sets Notion AI apart is how it personalizes responses based on your content. It's not just another generic chatbot. It understands the context of your work. Plus, it can search across thousands of docs in seconds, even connecting to tools like Slack and Google Docs. And get this, Notion is used by over half of the Fortune 500 companies. Teams using it send less emails, cancel more meetings, and save time searching for their work. It's designed to keep everyone on the same page while protecting your privacy. Want to give it a try? Head over to notion.com slash upstream pod. That's all lowercase. Notion.com slash upstream pod. You can try Notion for free, and when you use our link, you're supporting our show. Give the powerful, easy to use Notion AI a shot today at notion.com slash upstream pod. Hey everyone, Eric here. In this environment, founders need to become profitable faster and do more with smaller teams, especially when it comes to engineering. That's why Sean Lanahan started Squad, a specialized global talent firm for top engineers that will seamlessly integrate with your org. Squad offers rigorously vetted top 1% talent that will actually work hard for you every day. Their engineers work in your time zone, follow your processes, and use your tools. Squad has front-end engineers excelling in TypeScript, React, and Next.js, ready to onboard to your team today. For back-end, Squad engineers are experts at Node.js, Python, Java, and a range of other languages and frameworks. While it may cost more than the freelancer on Upwork billing you for 40 hours, but working only two, Squad offers premium quality at a fraction of the typical cost, without the headache of assessing for skills and culture fit. Squad takes care of sourcing, legal compliance, and local HR for global talent. Increase your velocity without amping up burn. Visit ChewSquad.com and mention Turpentine to skip the wait list. Say more about NVIDIA and where you think they're going and sort of the the headwinds or tailwinds they're, they're facing. Yeah, I mean, the moving to up to one year upgrade cycles is like totally unprecedented in, in, in this field. So they, they've, they've made a huge move to crush any, any buyer, particularly the big, bigger buyers curiosity with AMD. So Nvidia has outperformed AMD this year, I believe by almost 150%. I think moving to one year upgrade cycles was a huge reason behind crushing that that kind of AMD curiosity that a lot a lot of a lot of folks who are building these huge data centers think about is like you know Nvidia has ninety percent gross margins sixty percent operating margins like I'm literally just handing money tooth tooth and fist to to them how do I reduce my reliance on them you know if I'm meta I'm allocating twenty billion. You know, maybe maybe I want to test out AMD to to see if I can reduce that reliance. At least maybe it'll help me negotiate better. What I think has happened as a result of that is like, you know, a lot of the AMD curiosity has cooled down. There's kind of not really a close third after AMD as like an independent vendor. 
But what has happened is a lot of, particularly the hyperscalers, have started to invest more and more in their own internal offerings, the more let's build it ourselves approach. They were doing this last year and the year before, but they've really increased their spend a lot there. So it's estimated Google this year will spend over 10 billion with Broadcom developing a chip. Broadcom is kind of like a third party design firm, particularly for these AI oriented chips that almost every every one of the hyperscalers works with. Amazon works with them. Google is their biggest customer. And Microsoft is also working with them. Meta is working with them. ByteDance is working with them. So Broadcom has been a big beneficiary of this. How do we get get off of NVIDIA reliance problem? Within Broadcom, I mean, they have all of like the best customers. So if one of those starts to work, like that's kind of where I would expect it to come from. Google seems like they're the furthest ahead of all these other folks with, with TPUs. They're kind of the one major hyperscaler that's investing more in non-NVIDIA stuff than NVIDIA stuff right now. So I, I anticipate like, you know, don't underestimate Google. They could they could come out with a huge innovation there. It's already powering the training for most of their their models internally. So that that's where I'm looking. And then kind of through their partnership with Broadcom, that's who I, I would anticipate is is kind of gonna be a viable competitor. This probably over the next kind of two years versus this year immediately. But we'll see. I mean, every quarter NVIDIA has somehow managed to, to raise the ceiling on what they can do. They grew over 20% quarter over quarter last time, which is just insane at the scale that they're operating at. So no, no signs of slowing. We'll see it after a, a quarter, quarterly earnings report with, with NVIDIA if, if they ever do start to slow. That makes a lot of sense. How about you've covered... Companies like Snowflake and Databricks making these acquisitions at high level. How should we think about these these billion dollar or, or, or acquisitions that are close to that when there's not a ton of traction? How do you think about that just uh, at a high level? It's it's a super interesting space. I mean, I think there's kind of this convergence of uh, data platforms and and model platforms. I mean, model platforms are trying to creep into into data platform land, data platforms are trying to creep into into the model space, whether that's developing their own models. So what what Databricks did, actually maybe eighteen months ago, and buying Mosaic ML has been hugely successful. They kind of realized, you know, both of these things should happen in the same environment. ML people, data scientists, they're all kind of need to work in the same environment. They need to share the same common data infrastructure. So let's bring the models to the data is kind of their their approach with with Mosaic ML. It has been a super successful. There's kind of rumors that that Mosaic ML is approaching 100 million of ARR inside Databricks already, which is just insane to think about. Snowflake is is working on the same problem too. Of like we want to capture all this unstructured information. Historically, Snowflake has been number one in, in, in BI and structured data land. And they're trying to gather more and more of this unstructured information, which they've been pretty successful with so far. I think they, they kind of had the similar realization of let, let's bring models to the data environment. So, you know, these people who are building all these complex data engineering tasks within Snowflake can then go that next step of let's actually run the model inside of Snowflake. So they view it as that that logical extension of, you know, their business models compute. Some of that's like in the preparation of the data and the ingestion of the data, but it should also be how that data is is utilized by models and applications. So that I think that's why they're willing to pay so much. The talent bar to like actually build something that's competitive is just you need a lot of money <laughs> to to buy these companies. I think Mosaic ML was was almost twenty five million per employee. Reca, which ended up getting, which ended up not moving forward, was about forty million per employee. You know that that feels really high, but 
you could see if you have to make one bet and build a model developer team, you know, that's that's two percent of Snowflake's market cap. That's two percent of Databricks's market cap. If it if it can double the TAM of you know, we can we can capture that compute on the model side of things and compete with OpenAI and Anthropic and ultimately reduce our reliance on Microsoft. I think both Snowflake and Databricks really don't want a world where all that all the data that's inside their platforms is just kind of shipped to, to Microsoft, who owns the model and all the compute. That's kind of the worst case scenario for them. So it's it's both like offensive and defensive their moves here. Let's talk about with cool. Yeah, let's get into why, why Google may want to or want to acquire them and what, what that means. Yeah, so it means security is one of those few super rare businesses that can move the needle for hyperscalers. So, so Microsoft is the largest security vendor globally by far. They're doing over $25 billion of, of revenue. They're larger than Palo Alto Networks, CrowdStrike, Fortinet, Zscaler and Wiz like all combined. So it's the number one reason, besides some of the stuff they're doing in models, the number one reason enterprises are turning to, to Microsoft is they have built all this trust with handling enterprises' most sensitive data, and they've built all the security tools to actually secure that. So it is a, it, it's, it's been a, a huge, forcing function that's tipped the scale in, in Microsoft's favor over the past three to four years as security has become more important. You know, AWS has, has some security products, but they are less widely adopted. And I think that's that's on the margin really helped Microsoft a lot. Google, it, like security is super important to their business, both the, the Google Cloud business, which is I think 40 billion of revenue and growing 30% super important part of their business, but also it's the core of their entire consumer business, Gmail, all the data that, that they they work with. So you, you kind of can't invest too much in security there. I think they realize, you know, security, if we're going to really take Google Cloud to enterprises and like be able to, to have a, a viable competitive offering with Microsoft, we're going to need to to lead in security. And Wiz is, is by far the most advanced cloud security vendor. And that's kind of the origins of their company is that they actually sold their prior company, Adalum, to, to Microsoft in cloud security. They've been working on in the, in the space for almost 10 years, which is just insane because the problem is only about 10 years old. So they, they learned the ins and outs at Microsoft and that, that kind of helped them build Wiz. And I think. Google looks at Microsoft's security business with a lot of respect and is is thinking about, you know, how do we how do we at least get to level with them? And getting to level with them just will take it a huge, huge investment. So it's a bold move. I I quite liked I quite liked the the idea. I mean, for Google, that's about a quarter, like literally like one fiscal quarter, three months of operating income to, to make that bet, which is just insane, just shows you the scale of, of these companies and could be, you know, for Microsoft, I believe all their cloud revenue is like 150 to 200 billion. Security is like, is like a good 20% of that almost. So it's a good bet. I think that that expands the TAM. It's also growing much faster than than the cloud business overall for Microsoft. So it, it's it it's it'll be super important, I think, to to win enterprises, and it'll just become a you know there's a bunch of of fourth and fifth and sixth place vendor cloud offerings that I think are just going to fall further behind because the capital intensity you know you need to serve security too. So I think it's a really smart move. I mean, it's a it's a big price, but for Google, I mean, what could be more important than security? So that's a good that's a good overview. Let's. Is there anything more you want to share on the the Microsoft playbook and how Google is may, maybe thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, Microsoft really wants to consolidate the security suite. So Wiz is like one of those rare companies that actually is a platform. 
I mean, that's something as a venture investor we're always thinking about too is, you know, does this have a potential to become a platform? And that's such a rare... How do you define platform in this case? Yeah, multi-product and a bit like ability to incrementally sell more products plus service the broader surface area of the problem space that they're in. So for Wiz, it's, it's cloud security. I mean, it's not a full security platform that can service everything, but it's all your cloud needs, which is obviously kind of the future of where a lot of workloads are going. So they need a platform. Microsoft has built a platform largely by being first and early and incrementally adding more products. I mean, they haven't made a ton of huge acquisitions. You know, Palo Alto Networks is kind of trying to build a platform by acquiring leading vendors in new point solution products for 200 million to to a billion or so. It's been a super successful strategy for Palo Alto Networks. So they're kind of taking the opposite approach of let's build everything in house. And they're, they're kind of saying, you know, we have all the F2000s, let's just buy everything and sell, sell the stuff that they're doing. So I think that that has worked pretty well as well. Wiz is the pioneer in cloud security, which I think is where Google's coming at this from is, you know, let's, let's roll this out across all the GCP customers. I want to be mindful of time. This is perhaps a good place to, to wrap. Is there any other thing we didn't get to cover that you want to make sure we uh, you leave our audience with or anything, any other plugs or, or things you want to leave the, leave the listeners with? No, thank you so much for uh, inviting me, Eric. I mean, I really, really appreciate getting to talk with experts like you and I've had a ton of respect for you for a really long time. And yeah, check out, check out my newsletter and check out my colleague Zach's uh, newsletter as well. Yeah. No, likewise, I've really learned a lot from a lot of your your blog posts and highly recommend people read them. Zach also has a great one on on, on PLG and, and Wing just in general puts out great, great content. So Chris, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Until next time. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate it. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts, to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at ericaterpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together.